Good morning. Uh, very warm welcome here in the Space Center Baden-Württemberg Institute of Space Systems from all over the world. I see many, many, many known faces, but I see many unknown faces, at least to me. My name is Stefan Vasoulas. I'm the director of the Institute here of Space Systems, and I'm really, really very happy to see that many young faces, motivated faces, coming here together for the third Space Up conference. I think it's the third, third right? Here in Stuttgart? Okay, maybe the 15th. Okay. <laughs> But in parallel also more than the 20th, maybe the 25th space station design workshop. Uh, I welcome also all participants to this workshop. Um, it's the 50th anniversary today, some seven hours ago, of the first landing on the moon, Apollo 11. And by the way, I'm not sure whether everybody knows it, uh, 400 years of Harmonica Mundi, Kepler's laws, building the basics of all we are discussing today, and maybe also tomorrow in the next week for the space station. I'm not sure who had the longest way. I know one colleague who did not hesitate to come from, to Korea <laughs> for our Space Up conference. So welcome, Hanil. Um, I'm not sure, maybe you had the, really the longest way, huh? some, some 10 hours. So I will not give too uh, long talk, I had no presentation. Um, you know, it's an unconference uh, being organized by itself. We have some presentation about the Institute, what we are doing here. Some of the participants of the Space Station Design Workshop had already some tour here, and all others may ask me all the entire day what we are doing here and maybe uh, based on the other presentations. I would like to wish you all success, interesting talks, interesting um, discussions um, during the breaks, but also maybe during the presentations. Um, by the way, maybe I should mention, we have here in this room, by I guess some 80, 90 participants. And how many on the internet? Uh, 5,000, okay, 5,000. <laughs> 5,000 in the internet, so. All also on the remote positions, welcome to our Space Up conference in Stuttgart and all the success. Before I forget it, I would like to thank especially the organizing team. You see them all in the yellow shirts here, but in particular three of them, um, Lena Birch um, organizing that uh, event, Francisca, she left already, she's outside, and last but not least, Markus Grass. He's also something organizing. So thank you for your um, um, organization and efforts here and uh, all success and interesting talks to everyone. Thank you. Well, hello. Also welcome from my side, from KSAT's side. Welcome to Space Up Stuttgart 2019 on this historic date. 50 years after the first manned moon landing. Um, I know it might be the first space up for some of you. That's why I'm giving you some introduction now, how it works, what you should mention, what you should be careful of, and yeah. So first of all, what is KZ? Everywhere has written KZ, but nobody knows what it is. So that's why I'm going to explain it to you. Um, then some introduction, how the space up works, the, the schedule, how we will continue now. And of course, there are some other things you should know to survive this day. So, um, KZ is a student size society. Uh, we were founded five years ago with around 10 people, and now we are 75 people growing every day, every week, and every year. Um, our main goal is to be a communication platform between industry, science, um, um, research institutes like here at the Institute of Space Systems and students, so we are all students. Um, we have the goal to gather already during the studies hands-on experience on space experiments and um, projects. So we already conducted a bunch of projects, you can all see the batches here. Uh, if you want to know more about them, ask either the people in the yellow t-shirts 
go to our booth outside or just attend the talks by our members. Yeah, so how does it work, a space up? The first thing, you already saw the grid outside this wall with all the post-its. You can go there, take just a piece of paper, they're all down there on the desk, write down your topic, I think maybe 50 or 60% of you already prepared a talk. Um, write down your topic, choose whether you want to do a T-5 or T-20 talk. The difference is that for T-5 we have five minutes for the presentation and five minutes for questions from the people. And for T-20 you have 20 minutes for the presentation and afterwards 10 minutes for questions. So you can choose which format you want. And then you can choose a time slot. The, the timetable is almost free. And um, you just post it there and that's it. So you have to choose the room. So here that's hall one, hall two. And behind the blue wall outside is hall three. And um, after the lunch break, we will separate the rooms here so we, you don't disturb each other. Uh, one last thing for the SSDW attendees, please use the pink post-its over there. And I think you all prepared a T-5 lecture. So um, you can just post them. Um, I think it's the best to do it in the first uh, splinter because at uh, 5 p.m. you have another, another thing you have to do. I think I, I'm not allowed to say anything more about it. Um, well, one must ask about how it works in general. So this is an unconference and not a conference. So that's why we're not having nice clothes here, but just t-shirts and we're all relaxed. <laughs> so the thing is, it, it should be very communicational and um, without any higher standards. So um, everyone is a participant. Everyone is allowed to, to give a post, uh, to give a talk if you want to. Um, give a talk and you haven't prepared it yet, just do it. Do it with Lovett presentation. It's all up to you. Um, if you find yourself in a room with a talk which isn't interesting to you, use your feet, go out and go somewhere else, find, find new people, uh, talk about something else. And yeah, you should uh, use your own responsibility to find the people that are interesting for you, the topics that are interesting for you, because you should all gather something from today. And last but not least, uh, we prepare some food and for the lunch break and for the coffee break. Go out, eat, talk to people, and then it starts again from the beginning. <laughs> so if you, for example, talk about something very interesting during your coffee break, and you think, oh, that this might interest uh, um, somebody else, then just take a post-it, write down the topic, and do a real talk about it. OK. Um, I already mentioned the schedule, so some slots are already fixed now. We have um, afterwards the keynote lecture by Mr. Ewald, who's already in here, I have a sign, right? Um, then we have some short presentations. Mr. Fasulas mentioned about um, the research topic, or some of the research topic, not all, of the Institute. Um, afterwards, the keynote lecture by Ms. Detrell. And then we have the lunch break. So we're going to order some pizza. Uh, you're welcome to eat everything and um, it's free and yeah, just take it. And afterwards it's all free, so here you can post your presentations. And here's something else for the SSDW people, but I think you already got your introduction and you know where to go and when. And not to forget, um, Marcus, who just came in here, <laughs> and he's so nice and said, okay, we can do a soya simulator tour here because we have a real soya simulator here in the institute. So if you want to fly a spacecraft, just write your name in the list, which are also down there at the grid. Choose the time slot and you can go there. And um, if you don't want to drink, if you don't want to eat, if you don't want to listen, just go to the booth over there, look what the people brought to us. We have EVR uh, glasses, we have uh, Kaiser booth, we have the SGAZ here. So there are many interesting people and stuff, and so just take a look at them and talk to them. All right, um, something else, something else? Well, you already mentioned, uh, 
notice that we are going, we are live streaming now to the internet and also during the whole event we are going to take pictures and videos which we want to use for social media, for website and print material. So did you know that it's going to be um, filmed? If you really don't want to be on a picture, just come to me and say that so we, have come to, we can sort out the picture when, when you see your face. All right, uh, we prepared some Wi-Fi here. The name of the Wi-Fi is conference. This is the password. Please take a picture now or connect yourself now because you will always see this now. Then if you like the Space Lab and if you want to attend it next year and the year afterwards and so on, you are welcome to write your list down in the email address list we have at the reception so that we can store and save your email address just for the purpose to contact you the next year. And yeah. And foods and drinks are already mentioned, so they are for free. You're welcome to give us a donation. And more, one more hint, uh, the cups, um, please don't take them home. <laughs> it's not a present, sorry. <laughs> and please use them more than once. We have more than those you can see, but please use them several times. All right, so I think you already have taken a picture of the conference. And we also have EduRom here for all the students, so you can also use EduRom. If you have any further doubts, questions, or something else, just ask the nice guy in the nice yellow t-shirt. Or we also have some other Kesa t-shirts, for example, the blue one here. You can also ask him or any one of the institute. All right, that's so far from my side. Now, Mr. Ebert, it's your turn. And enjoy it. Yeah, gerne. Wollen wir den... Äh, Alles klar. Das nie vergessen, das ist immer teuer. Da. Danke. So, Technicalities. wrong. Let's start from the beginning. All set. Good morning. Thank you for choosing this very cool and nice seminar room instead of the hot uh, weather outside and uh, joining the space up. My name is Reinhold Ewald. I'm a professor at this institute, professor for astronautics and space station that is quite unique in Germany as is this university actually in doing a lot of uh, space related uh, research, uh, one of the most recognized uh, uh, universities in, uh, in Germany at least, if not in, in Europe, uh, on, on this field. Uh, what I want to go through today is the actual status uh, of uh, what we are doing in space flight these days, but also looking back from where we came from. And probably most of you were not born, in 69 uh, when the moon landing happened, I happened to be 12 years old and sitting with my pyjama in front of the uh, black and white television and trying to make sense out of what we are seeing. But I can tell you it moved me to the point that I'm uh, uh, over here now. There's a quick history of uh, space flight to be told. Well, it all started with the ability to put, to put something into orbit and keep it there. Uh, which is a, is a different task from just uh, hopping and, and coming down again. That uh, is uh, back in 57 with the Sputnik satellite. Already four years later, the first uh, human launched into space, and they do want to come back, those humans. So you have to invent all the this, this stuff around that safely brings a, a human back to Earth. Never forget when you are devising human space uh, projects. Uh, then the moon race started and uh, it was not by chance because it's also an enormous boost to the awareness of space flight in the world but also uh, people joining like you choosing STEM subjects, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics uh, in universities. Much of what we see in the US is still 
uh, coming from the Apollo days and the can-do attitude that uh, is there. And here we are today. If you think uh, there, there must be by now colonies on Mars or yeah, we are on our way to Saturn or Jupiter checking what is this uh, black slab doing in the neighborhood of Jupiter. We did it differently. We, we didn't follow that path, but uh, there was some sense in what, what happened then. This is actually what, what I uh, had as science fiction uh, imagination in, in back in 65, a television series going out into uh, deep space. Uh, there's a love affair between an American commander and a Russian safety officer. So all the elements that we have today, even on International Space Station, are already there, 65 in German television. And then, never forget, space happens in images. And the best images that I got that for a long time and still is uh, in the world, these are the images that uh, Stanley Kubrick created in his movie 2001 Space Odyssey with this big space station rotating slowly to create artificial gravity. There are spaceships coming up, they have to take up the motion of the space station in a more slight fashion. So that is the music that they are hearing. You can walk upright in the space station. Uh, you have nicely cut uh, spacesuits, not those bulky things that you see today. And you can have a drink. The water stays in the glass, or is it whiskey? Uh, you sit in nice chairs and you chat with your colleagues. This is the world as it's supposed to be in 2001, according to 1968. So 50 years last year ago. Well, you have to really use your imagination in order to make sense of what you're seeing on German television at least. I show you what, what the moon landing looked like in German television. This is a, a television shot from the control center. We never saw the landing, actually not in real time, because uh, this was filmed on a, on a film roll camera, not, not a live TV transmission. For, for minutes and uh, uh, hours we looked at this image and only the journalists accounted what they were hearing from the space to ground and what, what was happening. And only in the end, I jumped forward a little bit here, so to not to lose time. Oh, can I do this? No. Um, in the end, we, we, uh, we saw the, uh, the, the hazy shadow of a man and, uh, going down a ladder, and then we had to believe that this was the, the moon uh, landing and, and uh, entering for the first time uh, on, the, on the moon. Well, everything what you see now in uh, flashbacks to 50 years ago is edited. It has additional material from all the cameras and that uh, catching the scene. But the original thing only lived because we were aware that something great is happening, something unique to the world, that, that uh, for the first time men put uh, foot on the moon. Uh, men in the sense of humankind. So, this is uh, by the way a model of the uh, lunar lander that was shown there. Okay, at that time I thought astronauts must be heroes. Huh? Something like the right stuff, you know? These people always in glittery suits with helmets and chewing, uh, chewing gum and uh, uh, doing the darest uh, things that you can imagine. Well, I started also reading Mad, Mad magazine. Uh, again, after 50 years, Mad was, is now uh, coming to an end. And it, it somehow caught, caught the notion of the zero thing and, and put it into a nice uh, prospect. So astronauts are human beings. Believe me, I myself am I. I took a detour, not going directly to apply for an astronaut. That was also impossible because Germany was still uh, far away from having their own astronaut corps or uh, cooperating to put astronauts into uh, space. That only started in the 80s. So I, I uh, learned something decent, which is physics. I can only recommend experimental physics. And that brought me to this high altitude observatory uh, in Switzerland. with a marvelous view, as you can see and uh, uh, the, uh, the ability to work with a radio telescope. But then in 86, something changed. Uh, the Germany was looking for more astronauts uh, to go into space with the space shuttle at that time. And I applied and finally made it. But it was not uh, the US they sent me to, it was Russia. So I took up a training in 1990 in Russia to fly to the middle station. And this is kind of 
what, what is already foreshadowed in all these science fiction things and international cooperation. Russia opening up its uh, assets to uh, an international community and uh, the Germans, the Austrians, the French, everyone, ESA, they sent the astronauts to make this experience. In the end, I was able to perform a three-week space flight to this little station, uh, doing a lot of science, uh, especially in the medical field, and finding a lot of friends, like uh, the, the Russian crew I flew up with, Tsipliev and Lazutkin, and uh, the ones I came down, Corson and Kaleri, and even NASA at that time had always an astronaut to make this experience. And what you see now with ISS really comes from these times we were trying to, to lay the foundations of this international cooperation. And because of that, and because ISS, we are an international partner of the International Space Station, ESA now can send astronauts into space. These are the six that were picked in 2009 out of 8,500 applicants. So really harsh cuts uh, down to these uh, six uh, uh, persons. And because uh, all of them are uh, now already have been flying once into space, they even recruited the seventh one uh, from the shortlist, Matthias Maurer, who is now preparing uh, to fly into space himself. So, um, you probably in Germany, this is a very famous figure, Astro Alex, with a lot of messages from space, he flew twice, was a commander of the space station in the second flight, Samantha flew uh, a long-term mission, uh, setting a record for a woman uh, endurance in, in space. Um, uh, Thomas Pesquet was the last of this uh, group to fly and uh, today we have seen Luca Parmitano launching for his uh, second mission into space. This mission is called BEYOND. All those mission motto point to where the astronaut wants to put a focus on. Like uh, what uh, Alexander Gast named his mission Horizons, going beyond Horizons. And now Luca with BEYOND. And there's always a meaning in these uh, in these uh, emblems, in these logos of uh, the mission. You can see the helmet here represented a visor, Earth reflected in the visor, and he has chosen Italy in the middle of it because he's Italian. Um, the International Space Station, uh, we have um, the targets for human spaceflight, potential targets like the Moon, we have the Mars representation, we have knowledge, um, technology and exploration in the stars here. So there is a lot of meaning in these uh, uh, missions and uh, a lot of program as well. And in order to prepare for that, let's have a quick look at uh, how training looks like. It takes a while to uh, load uh, for these astronauts. That's the kind of training that also uh, I was undergoing uh, because in Russia things change uh, only, only, uh, oh, come on. I have to do it here, obviously, yeah. Uh, uh, things uh, change slowly in Russia, so but what is good will be kept for, for further use and uh, others uh, will be... Italian ESA astronaut Luca Palmitano is about to make his second flight to the International Space. I can, count, uh, uh, I can uh, tell you quicker. So they are on the way to another, there's another simulation in uh, their uh, bulky space suit, no comparison to... Uh, the, um, uh, the spacesuits that I've shown before from the science fiction movies. That's again the Beyond uh, logo that you see here. And um, Luca and his crew are uh, taking up uh, training um, in this um, uh, Star City training center in Russia, where I spent also a lot of my time. Um, there are three of them, an American uh, first flyer, Drew Morgan, the uh, Soyuz commander is always a Russian, in this kind it's uh, Sasha Skvortsov. And uh, you see how tight all this is, what a tight fit you have. Uh, this is not a, a, a spacious spacecraft where you get served drinks and uh, can have a journal uh, to read, but it's rather uh, the minimum <coughs> minimorum in order to take you into space. And this is, shows how difficult it is to go into space, so, uh, how you cope with it. This is basic problems in order to keep humans alive uh, when they are going into space. I don't want, because of the time, I don't want to go in all the detail of this. Ah. Okay, let's stop it here and move on. So, finally, all your preparations bring you to launch day. And launch day is a very special day um, because uh, you are kept away from uh, seeing the, the rocket uh, being 
hold out, uh, you are in a quarantine, you, you concentrate as an astronaut, you concentrate on what's going to happen the next day. And uh, you see how this looks in reality when you are, uh, are squeezed with your spacesuit inside a Soyuz. This is Thomas Pesquet, uh, the French ESA astronaut, and uh, there's a third person here, you don't believe me. But uh, uh, it's, it's not a real spacious uh, uh, thing. And then uh, finally, the, uh, the rocket launch happens. And that is, if you had tuned in last night, 1828, uh, uh, you'll be in the uh, summertime, you would have seen this. This is the Soyuz prepared for launch. And from that moment on, um, 8 minutes 30, you are in space. So this uh, is a three-stage uh, rocket. Two stages are ignited at the same moment. You lift off from a very traditional uh, launch pad, the, the Gagarin launch pad that has been used now for 50 years or more than 50 years, even 60 almost. And, uh, and you see the typical sign of uh, the Soyuz rocket, the star-like um, uh, uh, arrangement of the engines that uh, burn for two minutes. Two minutes, you are propelled with 3G, three times the Earth's force, uh, you are propelled into space. Inside the rocket, it's astonishingly quiet. You think your uh, head is breaking loose. It's only outside that you get these vibrations, that you get the body feeling of uh, what enormous force is released in these rockets. 300 tons of uh, uh, material are put on the stage on the, uh, on the launch pad and only 7 tons uh, arrive in space. 7 tons is the, uh, is the mass of this uh, spacecraft. All the rest is fuel uh, that is put as energy into your body. You see these little uh, toys here and from the frequency you can already guess that uh, it's not Earth's gravity, it's more, it's an acceleration beyond Earth's gravity. Uh, as soon as this is weightless, all everyone inside here is weightless. Uh, there's Luca sitting in the board engineer uh, place and that happened last night and it went perfectly so that in the end you may go and have a look at uh, these uh, images in YouTube as well. So uh, in the end, they arrived at space station. And that is a very emotional moment. We have now six persons again on space station called uh, Expedition 60 with the Russian commander. And they are eagerly awaiting the arrival of uh, the newcomers. Uh, they have prepared some tea. They have prepared some nice uh, uh, bites uh, for them because uh, the Soyuz is not a place where you cook a, a decent meal. You see Christina Koch, uh, an American astronaut, uh, uh, she will go for the long run. She will go beyond six months. She will stay ten months or more uh, on board of International Space Station, and uh, uh, with the, uh, her uh, leader station, uh, even Luca Parmitano will take over the uh, commandership of the uh, uh, space station. You see the flags of the participating countries: Russia, the Soviet commander, the American, and the uh, Italian flag. Uh, but honestly, uh, nationalities don't count on board of such a space station. It's the team that works for the common goal, that is the most important thing. I wonder whether I can speed it up here. I can, I can do that. So let's see when they come in. Hopefully here. So the hatch is opened. And that is the very first moment of greeting, which is always very emotional, especially for those uh, on the ground who see their loved ones arriving in a completely new environment. But uh, uh, it's also, it, it means, uh, let's get to work. Immediately after the cameras are switched off, there will be a safety briefing. Um, you, you will learn how the uh, emergency exits are located and the uh, 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 suits underneath your. Uh, 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 seat. So this is squads of uh, flying in, and you can already guess people have been in space. They experience with weightlessness, or they are newcomers and very uh, kind of uh, shaky. Uh, if that is possible, in weightlessness in, in their movements. So you need to. <laughs> he did a, He was using too much force. That is always uh, detrimental in space. Who uh, Morgan is the first time flyer, and uh, after some while, we also see Luca Parmitano uh, flying in. 
and then they do a press conference, which is awkward, I tell you. You just arrived at the space station, it's completely new to you. You try to make sense of what you're seeing, and then you are asked, oh, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, you, owe, you owe the regards to the family. So, all of them are together, and we can move on. Uh, that's what uh, happened yesterday. And uh, you have always uh, prepared to be prepared also for bad days. You don't wish to have bad days. Maybe you hit the press when you, when you have bad days, but um, you, you want to be prepared. I had a bad day, actually, in the 14th day of my three weeks mission. We had to, uh, to put on a gas mask because a fire broke out. We had an explosion in an oxygen candle. And for hours, the uh, whole atmosphere of the station was filled with uh, smoke and uh, vapor and things that we didn't want to inhale. So we had these uh, oxygen masks and we didn't know whether we could go on, actually. Two soldiers uh, attached to uh, the mill station. If we had gone, I think that would have been the end of uh, the mill station. In the end, we decided to go on. Uh, we get, got rid of these gas masks and finally cleaned the whole station in the middle of it. Sunday night, we cleaned the whole station from the suit and from the uh, remains of the uh, fire and we decided to go on. That was a lucky escape, I have to say, but it saved also my science, which was my, my most concern, that we would lose all the science that had been prepared. I wasn't there when that happened, too. Uh, I mean, I'm not always uh, uh, built here. But uh, this was a collision with a progress transporter that uh, rendered the spectrum module uh, useless. Uh, to, was losing air, but in the end they could regain at least the electricity for it. There's so much debris nowadays that we have to constantly uh, bring the International Space Station out of harm's way by uh, lifting its orbit, and it's uh, with an increasing t tendency. Um, sometimes you can't avoid it uh, by chance collisions, but sometimes uh, there are even uh, still today nations that uh, deliberately destroy something in, in a very important orbit and then uh, you really have to take care in order to avoid the consequences for the working satellites. Luca himself in his first mission met uh, almost with an with a improbable um, uh, accident. He, he uh, was threatened to drown in space. Where does the water come from that you can drown in space? Well, there was a shortcut between the uh, air purification system and the uh, cooling system of his suit. And uh, half an hour in his EVA, he noticed that his helmet was filling with water. You should not think that water is coming up like this in, uh, because there is no gravity. Water is all around. It's clinging to your uh, head. It, it, it clogged his ears. It was coming in his eyes almost in his nose, and with, with uh, minutes to spare, he made it back to uh, the, the airlock. Just using the little tuck of his tether, his safety tether, uh, to give him directions into the airlock. A very dangerous situation. He will have five to seven EAs in front of him now in these six months that he's on space station, and he will do a repair and a, a refurbishment of the um, valuable astrophysical instrument called AMS, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. So that will be a rem reminder from the time he was almost suffering death in space. Well, there are failed Soyuz launches. Uh, Soyuz is the most um, uh, uh, reliable uh, human-rated uh, space flight system. A lot of hundred uh, launches, more than hundred, uh, why far more, a couple of hundred launches um, uh, successful. But from time to time it happens that um, uh, something is uh, going wrong. That was the case here. In last October, October 11th, uh, the uh, boosters that are supposed to detach from the uh, Soyuz rocket after two minutes did not detach uh, because of a failed uh, oxygen relief valve that did not open. And so um, the, what happened was, it's hard to see, it, they made a ballistic uh, ascent, then the Soyuz um, is, uh, exploded into three parts, which is meant that way, and the middle part, the screw cabin, came down in a parabola some 400 kilometers away from the launch pad. It was a short flight, and you can even hear the Russian commander say, oh, uh, in, uh, in a very, very uh, uh, concentrated voice, very nice. And um, uh, this was filmed from the space station. This is a, uh, an image from the space station. And a good uh, message, glad our friends are fine, thanks to the rescue force. 
They used a system that was 30 years not in use, but still flown on the Soyuz, and the one time it had to function, it functioned. So space flight is hard, but we must keep trying for the benefit of humankind. Well, you have to come down. Um, if you can do it that quickly, okay, this is an emergency uh, descent, but the normal descent uses the atmosphere, and uh, you re-entry in your Soyuz, and um, then the model separate, and only this part has a, 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 a heat shield, only this part here has a heat shield to uh, shield it from the, from the heat of re-entry, and you feel like a piece of meat. I mean, you cannot do anything. There are forces, 5, 6 G working on you. You are strapped into your seat, uh, and, and the, there is a kind of a shashlik uh, going on <laughs> as you, you are thrown in all directions. And the only thing uh, you can hold on, cling to, is that the doctors say, OK, whatever happens to you, you are fit enough to withstand it. So I was lying there and thinking, oh, this is a funny right here. Uh, but in the end, the parachute goes up, and you have a quarter of an hour uh, to concentrate on your what the Russians call soft landing, mm -hmm. uh, which is very sportive, uh, so that you don't break your legs and uh, hands and uh, keep back your tongue and bite your teeth and uh, be concentrated. In the end, uh, you end like this. This is a Shenzhou, same uh, procedure. The shuttle was milder in coming down, but uh, the tile system that kept the heat away was very sensitive to damages, as uh, we have seen with the loss of uh, Columbia and six lives. Uh, uh, later on. So this is the uh, Soyuz landing. Uh, we are really shaking through and, and you need some time to recover. That is why the rescue forces bring you uh, to a tent. But uh, today the six months flyers on space station are so trained that they can, uh, after a good uh, sound sleep, go and, and uh, arrive in Cologne um, uh, in a very good shape. We are doing science on board. This is our main purpose. Uh, ever after 2008, even there is a, there is a European laboratory called Columbus uh, on board of space station. A lot of the elements of uh, space station are European, by the way. Also the cupola, where you get all these nice photos from. And um, we think that uh, ISS operation is finance until 2024, but uh, a space station can live longer than that, and it would make sense to uh, come up with ways to uh, operate space station even after 2028. Space station is by far the most complicated, biggest machine human have, humans have ever built. This is a, the full view of it, even with the space shuttle attached. There is a European vehicle called ATV. There are Russian vehicles, H, uh, the Soyuz and Progress spacecraft. There are Japanese, there are American commercial vehicles all arriving at space station, just like the Werner von Braun model that you saw Stanley Kubrick uh, putting into space in 68. Only it's not rotating because we are interested in microgravity. And uh, rotation would uh, destroy our microgravity facilities there. It's a, a football field size, and I mean a German football field, a European football field. Um, it's 110 by 80 meters. It has the volume of a 747. And uh, as you can see now, 60 expeditions have already arrived. So a couple of hundred people have already been uh, on board of the uh, space station. And uh, this is the view of Columbus being hoisted by the Robert Arm Canada as a partner uh, with its uh, can, uh, Canadian arm. And there's a lot of science going on. Something never changed. You have to draw your own blood. <laughs> that is Alexander Gastelum to say. He even got a license for that. So if you have a need to uh, have a blood draw, I can help you then. <laughs> These are the, the numbers of the list of uh, vehicles going up. And what is completely new, believe me, I had 20 rolls of film. You know what film is still? Yeah? It's celluloid and you can't look at it because then it's spoiled. You need to wait until it's developed. Uh, 20 rolls of 36 exposures. And I never knew what I was photographing. Today, this is uh, in a minute or so. Um, you have thousands of digital images, brilliantly uh, made by the astronauts, uh, uh, good objectives. And it's all immediately available on social media. So this is a really new feature for, for this generation. The tweets from space, you can do kind of uh, quizzes. Where is the spacecraft in this image? OK, it's up here. It's approaching space station. And you see the Italian lakes uh, underneath. Or you can do what, what I call a global understanding. This is really a global image. You see uh, a cloud formation spreading out over a whole ocean. 
this, this is the help of a good uh, fish eye lens. You, you see that. Or you do your selfie, yeah? smartphone first. You, you open the hatch of the, uh, of the airlock, and the first thing is smartphone out and uh, do a selfie. <laughs> but what an amazing sight. I mean. Yeah. Now up to you. I, I mean, I, I step back now and leave you to the future. <laughs> That's what you what you are meant to. You will face that targets are easily uh, listed. I mean, this is uh, within reach. Let's say uh, we, we do lower Earth orbit. We, we plan to go not back to the moon but forward to the moon, as we call it, because we do it with new skills, with new co uh, possibilities. It's not a repetition of. Uh, what we have seen in the Apollo days, and uh, we all need that in order to prepare for Mars. This is the common uh, path that is uh, visible. Uh, we need a good uh, sound uh, basis of uh, uh, telling people why we want to go out. And every one of this is not enough to uh, merit uh, a large program, a lot of money by the politicians. Uh, we need to, to uh, tune the, uh, the messages and uh, the things we want to do with exploration in order to, uh, to find the necessary support that was there for the Apollo mission. And the Apollo mission had a vision. This is the most important thing, uh, that, that uh, people can unite uh, behind a mission. The Apollo mission was kind of a national, uh, a, a national goal uh, to put an American on the moon and uh, to return him at that time, I think, was called or, or the person safely uh, within a decade. There are visions out like this one here, the Jan Werner, the now head of the ESA, um, of ESA, the European Space Agency, he put out the Moon Village vision, say, I'm inviting everyone. I'm not saying that there are already blueprints and uh, that we have the money to do all this, but everyone who wants to join in a peaceful undertaking that unites humanity, in a, in a good cause, not in war, but in, in a good cause, is invited to uh, contribute to this. In order to make this not only the icon of the last century where I was influenced, but also to put a foot back on the moon and go on to Mars for the next uh, generation. There are a lot of missions like uh, uh, imaging the moon surface. Uh, India has committed uh, to also now um, explore the moon with, a, with a, uh, its own thing. China has suddenly come up uh, with a series of very, very fine uh, moon missions like the Chang'e 4 on the far side, far side, not the dark side, the far side of the moon. And it, it used a uh, communication satellite first also uh, in order to relay the images and relay the commands uh, uh, to, the, to the Earth because by principle you don't see the far side of the moon. So you cannot do a, a easy communication there. A good, good uh, choice there. And there are um, kind of immersion, commercial undertakings that also want to go beyond low Earth orbit and to the moon. One of the most prominent was the Google Lunar X Prize. If you happen to, to have a device that is going to the moon, uh, does a soft landing, drives 500 meters and uh, makes good images and photos, you would have been uh, receiving 20 million, but no one did that. A uh, couple of companies came into the competition and now are doing things outside of the competition because they, they really liked it. Uh, um, by the way, there is an Italian uh, mission that was part of the moon uh, X-rays that tried to land on the moon a couple of weeks ago but did not succeed, unfortunately. And there is this official program that is uh, something where NASA steps uh, to a press conference and says, we want to do this. And you see, uh, changing with the presidencies, uh, things come in and out. Uh, there was the, the notion that we have an RS-1 and 5 rocket bringing an Orion spacecraft uh, to the moon. That was all cut, the budget cuts. Uh, um, and uh, at, the, at the time, the Augustine Commission, a uh, uh, very high level commission said, it's completely underfinanced. there's no way to go uh, to the moon. So we rather stop it now than uh, pay uh, bad money. Um, but nowadays, the idea is to have an Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle after some deterioration to go to an asteroid. It's now direct, directed to the moon and uh, beyond. Um, together with a space launch system, this draws heavily on the shuttle heritage. So it has the shuttle main engines, it had boosters that uh, propelled the shuttle into space. <laughs> so not all is lost. 
and we will see exploration uh, flight tests. One, this is, has already happened uh, with an Orion spacecraft and uh, um, uh, another version of a, uh, of a carrier. And uh, we will see uh, um, uh, Artemis missions to the moon, which is the first manned space flight. We will, see, um, uh, an, uh, we will first see an uh, unmanned space flight around the moon, then a manned space flight. And already with the third mission, uh, according to a presidential decree, um, uh, people should return to the moon. Um, well, if you believe in uh, presidential decrees, be my guest. Uh, these days, uh, I mean, uh, let's see it. Uh, I, I'm more <laughs> interested in safety. I, I don't want to do operations on time, uh, 24, when the presidency ends, but I rather want to have it safe, and uh, this should not compromise these things. So all that has to do with another project that is coming up, which is the lunar orbital, uh, uh, <laughs> lunar orbiting platform gateway or the gateway, and uh, this is again an international undertaking. You, you will uh, there is an invitation to, for the um, current uh, partners of the International Space Station to, to contribute to this uh, gateway. Well, we have to see, we have to still negotiate what the contribution is, whether it's uh, something like a guest role in an American vehicle or whether it's a self-standing role that uh, also is kind of a partnership. Uh, you see Russia uh, invited to do a, uh, the, the, uh, this is a Federatia, a, a vehicle and the airlock. We, we can uh, imagine that the habitation module may, may be uh, done by ESA, JAXA uh, and uh, NASA, uh, the, we will see the Orion spacecraft attached to this uh, gateway uh, together with the European service module and this is the heritage of the ATV, the automated transfer vehicle which was sent to the International Space Station. So, a lot of things is happening, hopefully safe, but hopefully in order also to give you uh, the, the good feeling of being part of an ex, uh, exquisite and uh, unique uh, development Certainly you want to, to push on from the moon to Mars, which is understandable. I sit in a rocking chair, not a rocket, but in a rocking chair, and uh, I will watch you uh, doing this. Uh, the first steps will be taken in this week when we start with the design of the Space Station Design Workshop. I wish you good luck, and as Markus uh, said, have a lot of fun doing space flight. Thank you for being here, and hope that you fulfill my dream seeing you on Mars someday. Back to Lena. So thank you and welcome also from my side. Uh, I will give you the first presentation about one of the uh, working groups here in the University of Stuttgart. My name is Thomas and uh, I, will talk you, I will talk about the exploration of moons in the solar system with in-situ dust detectors. So as, the, as you may see from the title, 
I'm from a working group, group called Cosmic Dust. It's interesting and fascinating and don't start with dust jokes, I heard them all. So um, yeah, today I will just focus on the moons since this should be a moon focused thing. But not only about the our moon, yeah, where the astronauts saw the, uh, and smelled the dust like for example Gene Kernan from Apollo 17. He uh, went back to the, to the module after an EVA and said, well, it makes like someone just fired a carabine in here. So somehow it smelled like gunpowder. Interestingly, the dust on the moon has nothing to do with gunpowder. So the chemical composition doesn't make any sense. So this Satan, but also other astronauts said that it smells like gunpowder or, or what, whatsoever. Probably because of the sweat and everything, combination with the dust, it smells like this. I don't know. Tough works, a lot of working hours. I don't know what, what, why they thought it smells like a carabine, but uh, yeah, maybe it's small, interesting, nice fun fact about cosmic dust. But we are not uh, talking about the Apollo mission today. We are going beyond the moon. Yeah, the moon has been visited by several spacecraft and a few human explorers. One um, robotic mission was a lunar atmosphere and dust environment explorer, short called LADY. Uh, this was one mission going to our moon, but we have also several other moons in our solar system, like for example, uh, the Galilean moons at Jupiter. We have Io, one of the most volcanic uh, moons um, in the solar system. We have Europa, we have Ganymede, we have Callisto. And all of these moons have been visited by spacecraft and we have a lot of uh, we have nice ideas about their inner processes thanks to cosmic dust. And um, also, for, we have a lot of data from another, from another uh, planetary system, from Saturn. I will go into this in more detail. Like, for example, with Saturn, we have the moon Enceladus, we have Iapetus, or Titan. Yeah, three totally differently looking uh, moons, but all visited by the Cassini spacecraft and with our instrument, the Cosmic Dust Analyzer, and you will hopefully get an idea of the fascinating work we are doing here. But the question is, why and how shall we measure cosmic dust? I mean, it sounds boring, but it's not. You can think about dust like an information carrier. I mean, talking about being a physicist, I'm also a physicist. So, uh, you know, the photon is like as a wave character, as a, a particle character. And I don't want to compare now dust with the photon, but in a, it's somehow related because the dust particle contains dynamical information, contains material information, material properties, compositional information, for example, chemical stuff, organic, organic molecules, and so on. And this dust helps us to reveal and understand the processes within moons or in the environment of moons and whatsoever. We are doing a lot of things, not only about moons, but one of the biggest uh, results from our working group will be shown in the next slides. The cosmic uh, dust group here in Stuttgart uh, played a major role in the Cassini-Huygens uh, mission. Uh, it was a mission launched 1997. We went to Saturn, reached Saturn 2004 and plunged into Saturn 2017. And probably Cassini was one of the most sophisticated and remarkable robotic missions ever made. I mean, it's, it was a generation project. Everybody says space science is generation, pro, uh, is generation projects. And everybody says, yeah, well, yeah, sounds like everybody says, everybody says is gen, uh, space science takes decades and so on. But Cassini is a very good example. I mean, I saw the, uh, the original um, idea paper from, 18, from 1990, so when I was born. The launch was, launch was 1997 when I was in elementary school. Then at some point it went to Saturn. I was in, yeah, let's say, the, the, the high school ponto in Germany. And then I went to the university, studied, and then at the end I made my PhD about a mission about an instrument on the Cassini mission. So yes, it's a generation project and we have enough data for the next generation, even for the smallest visitors, the youngest visitors here. So how did the cos cosmic dust analyzer look like? Well, it was like a tube, like a, like a telescope, basically. And you can imagine it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a tube opening and in the, at, the, at the back we have something like, a, let's call it a mirror or a target. And the particles are flying with a high speed, like 20, 30 kilometers an hour. 
smashing the, uh, the background. Hmm? A second. Kilometers a second. Kilometers a second, what did I say? An hour. I know, per second, of course. And the particles are evaporating, ionizing, and the ions are flying to, uh, um, are accelerated by uh, um, electric, um, by, 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 by voltage. And then you have something like a time of flight mass spectrometer where the, um, yeah, the, 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 the like hydrogen is coming first to the detector, then heavier elements, and then you can see the time of flight spectrometer, uh, spectrum with all the elements inside this one unique particle. We have also different grids and channels to determine other dynamical properties. So at the end, we have like six million, uh, six million dust particles with 500,000 spectra with 200 gigabytes of data. So as a summary, I can say it's a lot. And one of the most remarkable uh, yeah, science results comes from moon Enceladus. So Enceladus is a very small moon, an icy moon. Here from an image, you see something where's the jet propulsion in the South Pole. No, it's, uh, it's like volcanic activities, but it's not lava or magma or whatsoever. It's just, these are ice particles. And uh, the Cassini mission was extended, 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 and with every extension, uh, the mission became more and more daredevil style. So at some point, we, NASA said, OK, let's fly through this plume, just 30 kilometers across the surface, and see what's inside. And they knew, or well, they know we have the cosmic dust analyzer. We can measure the particles. Let's see what we measure there. And where everybody expected, like, water ice because it's an icy moon. So, okay, just give it a try. Flying through the, through the uh, plume, the instrument got damaged actually, um, a little bit yeah, quite severely, but it worked until the end, so everything was fine. And then we got some uh, spectra, and these spectra showed water ice and also some other organic and material compositions. And we have a collaboration with other institutes, for example, the geophysicists from Heidelberg and Berlin. They identified the chemicals, the organics, and said, well, these organics can only be created in a liquid environment. So something like an organic film on a liquid surface. You have gas bubbles coming up in this, let's say, bank, and they're freezing, going into this volcanic uh, activity and then being measured by our instrument. So this was one of the very first, um, yeah, the very first evidence for liquid water outside our home planet. You can imagine it like maybe, it's just, just, just an illustration, some, some hot, hot, uh, hot spots under the, uh, in the, in the ocean here, on the surface, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, iron core or whatsoever, heating everything up due to gravitational uh, disturbances, but this is just theories, uh, how the energy, how the moon creates energy to liquefy all the, all the ice. Another interesting uh, result was from, a, is from the first paper was from 2016, called Dust Occultation at Titan Measured by CDI on board Cassini by Mr. Sama. And this is something, well, what he says is this is kind of new astronomy, new science work. So what did we do here? In the Saturn system, we have a lot of very tiny dust, nanodust. So it's very, just a few tens of nanometers sized. They are highly charged and, uh, and accelerated by the uh, magnetic field. So they are um, escaping Saturn more or less in a radial, radial velocity outside. So you measure these particles when you point to Saturn, well, very nice. But we used Titan several times for gravity assist, I think like 200, 120 times or so. And we were measuring this nanodust coming from Saturn. And of course, here you don't measure anything if you're, if you're behind the moon. You leave the moon again and then you measure it again. Interesting thing is that Titan has an atmosphere, so you don't see like let's say, a binary profile where it just cuts, you know, it's more like a very smooth and nice profile. And based on cosmic dust measurements, we can determine properties from the atmosphere of another moon. So this is like really fancy stuff. And uh, Mr. Sama said, well, this is something like a new cosmic dust research area. 
And we only applied it for Titan because Titan has a very dense and uh, sophisticated atmosphere. But let's see what the, what the future brings. And um, if you are a student, if you want to come to Stuttgart and you think, hey, cosmic dust is very interesting, well, we built instruments for, uh, next instrument will be built for, uh, for a Japanese mission. We have a dust accelerator, it will be currently set up in a laboratory. And we also do extremely sophisticated data-driven analysis. So if you want to do engineering, lab work, and data analysis, you're very welcome. So thank you for uh, listening, and yeah, enjoy, enjoy the Sunday here. <laughs>
swap um, so you um, can see a, a great um, kind of great piece of, of uh, land being underneath the satellite. Uh, another experience, the AES receiver. I don't think many of you will hear of AES because it's a ship system and ships is not really the thing that uh, the aerospace engineers are into, but it's used for identification of ships and you can receive it from the satellite. Um, we also have an in-house developed S-band downlink with 10 mbits per second for payload data downlink. And of course, uh, optical data downlink system, which is an experiment with DLR in Oberfachhofen. But speaking of experiments, oh no, we have uh, operations first. Uh, we saw the video of the um, ground station for Apollo. Um, it's kind of difficult to imagine what it's like to sit in a ground station with your spacecraft in orbit if you haven't done it before. So you only get data from and see numbers and you only the only information you have is numbers so you're sitting there they are staring on your numbers if they're correct or not but you have this kind of uh, feeling that um, it's something great going on here so in the in the first days especially the first contact feels very very uh, uh, you feel very lucky if you if you um, see the satellite and everything goes well so we had, we had that kind of luck here. And uh, we finished our first phase of operations after four days, um, which is check out of all basic components and started the payload commissioning. And uh, if, you, if you're trained in a simulator before, so we have a simulator here and trained all the operations staff, trained with, uh, with the team of many students here overnight um, in the week before. And, We've all uh, we've in failures injected in the simulation, and we lost the satellite in some simulations before. And then the real operations was very simple. The satellite came in, and it was perfect. So uh, kind of boring, also. <laughs> um, now we're in orbit since two years now, and it's we are in the over 10,000 10, orbits now, and. 4,000 ground station passes. So, um, typical normal operations. So, come to some experiments. Um, we see the image map of flying laptops. So, we see the, tip, the campaigns we have with flying laptop um, for imaging, um, especially in Europe. In the last weeks or months, we have a South Asia campaign in Malaysia. Um, you see some campaigns here, which is uh, pictures of an ice shelf which is breaking up um, and we're interested in if someone's interested in getting pictures of, of something and want to sh uh, look at the pictures and do some science stuff of it we're interested in uh, in any cooperation so come here feel free to join um, we also received a lot of pictures in AES messages and did some attitude experiments with GPS um, well, other technical stuff, but kind of interesting to uh, get the attitude out of GPS. And we have an optical data downlink system, which I already mentioned. But today is a, it's about moon, and interestingly, we do have some moon experiments. And moon does not only teaches us something about the moon itself; it's always it's also teaching us something about the Earth. So the experiment is you want to know the earth shine or albedo. So the, the reflected um, energy from earth. And moon is, is a reflector of the, what's reflecting from earth to the moon and back to your telescope. And you can observe, uh, observe that from the ground, but you always have the atmosphere in between you and the moon. So we're trying to, or we did observe the moon, and uh, measured the distribution of brightness um, in, together with an earthbound telescope and the Danish Meteorological Institute. And it's possible to put a telescope in space uh, to get better data for the Earth's albedo, which is used in climate models and to pr um, improve the understanding of climate. Um, yeah. And so I come to an end with a moonrise. 
that's actually moon coming up behind the atmosphere, but the atmosphere is not in the light. So you see the moon is coming up behind the atmosphere, getting larger and larger, and um, almost full in the end. So okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions about the flying laptop? No? So I saw our third <laughs> lecture arrived now. And we will continue with a high altitude balloon project. Do you have the presentation on stage? Yes, it should be on the computer. I also have a stick. Yeah, maybe it should be better to have a stick because you don't have a Thanks a lot and good morning from me as well. I'm Philip. Um, it's a bit unfortunate, Lena already gave the secret away. Um, this is actually the wrong cultural reference. I won't be speaking about flying to the moon. Um, it would be more accurate to change this uh, to this uh, a little bit later reference. <clears throat> well, at least from my side, I know that I probably won't have the chance to fly to the moon or the stars anymore. Maybe one of you will have the chance, but I'll have to make do with the next best thing, which would be looking at the moon or the stars. Um, and it turns actually out that balloons are a pretty, pretty nice tool to do so. What am I talking about? Um, these balloons, not quite. These, a little bit closer. Um, I'm actually talking about these. Uh, might not be as uh, aesthetically nice as the last two, more looking like jellyfish, if you like. But these scientific helium balloons will get you a payload <clears throat> of four tons, so quite comparable with um, typical satellite payloads, to an altitude of 30, 40 kilometers. Um, now you know which kind of balloons I'm talking about. The question is, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about this at a space up? Um, you might already have gotten the, the idea that I'm talking about, that I'm coming from the scientific side, I'm talking about astronomy mostly. I don't know whether any one of you has tried to do astronomy from Stuttgart. We've tried. And unfortunately, all the, the milky bits here <clears throat> in the picture are not the Milky Way. They might be some artifacts of bad processing of our image, but if you had a larger part of the sky, you would see that it becomes less and less milky the higher in elevation you get. <clears throat> so a lot of these milky bits is actually light from street lamps, from buildings, what in astronomy we call light pollution. So in Schutka, there's a couple of things that an astronomer would rather not want in his or her um, observing site. One is the light pollution, another thing is clouds, another thing yet is the atmosphere in general, at least for observational purposes. So being at a space up and at a space institute, the most obvious solution would likely be, well, we go to space. We observe from there. Um, and that's of course the, the, best, the best conditions that you can get, however, it comes with a bit of a price tag. So if you're looking at JWST, looking at a price of up to now, I think uh, 8.8 .8 billion US dollars. If you're looking at similar 
large astronomical space missions, the prices don't differ so much. Uh, Herschel was around, it was reasonably cheap, with one billion. If you break that down into scientific papers, around 1,000 papers were written um, up to now about Herschel data, then you end up at a price tag of around one million per paper. Um, Hubble was even more expensive, however, one has to be fair. Um, Hubble has been in orbit for quite a long time and given us quite a lot of observation time. But besides the price tag, um, there are a couple of other difficulties with space-based astronomical missions. One is their size restrictions. In astronomy, unfortunately, in many aspects what counts is size, the aperture size of your telescope. That's the reason why JWS2 is going to, through so much effort and pain um, to have a very elaborate folding mechanism for a seven and a half meter mirror. So what you want in astronomy is collecting area for the light and the resolution that you get directly scales with, with size. So we need large sizes. And if we don't want to go with these very elaborate and technically challenging and expensive uh, mechanisms like JWST, we're currently limited to around three and a half meters diameter that we can fit into a payload fairing. Um, this is just as a side note, by the way, also why I believe that the kind of paradigm shift that's happening in the space world with cheaper launches, with more satellites, with a different way of building satellites has not really arrived in astronomy yet. Or astronomy has not really benefited from it yet so much. And there's another um, downside I would like to mention, which is you can't just go and refill cryogens on a spacecraft or repair something. Some of you might remember how the very early Hubble images looked like on the left. And if we hadn't had the opportunity the lucky opportunity to be able to fly with the space shuttle to Hubble to fix the optics, they would be look, still looking like this and not like this. So there are some obstacles to doing astronomy from space. Now remember I said one of the main things that astronomers don't want for their observation site is atmosphere. And if we look at the atmosphere, we actually don't have to go quite as, as far as to space if you want good observational conditions. Sorry, this is the only more technical slide that I have. Um, so here you see a bit of a comparison of the, only the transmission of light through the atmosphere. And you're likely very aware that most of the um, uh, electromagnetic spectrum does not make it all the way to the ground. As you can see on this new line, um, which represents some of the higher observatories on ground, like in the Atacama Desert, um, the green curve represents what the observation conditions that you get roughly at plane altitude, at airplane altitude, so for example with Sofia. And the red line at the very top represents what you get at, this is even a reasonably low um, balloon flight altitude of 30 kilometers. And you see there's not much obstruction anymore, really almost space-like conditions in terms of observation conditions. So. What can you actually do? Um, admittedly, balloon launches and balloon flights cannot be quite as long as uh, space flights. So what is currently done um, are flights that range from roughly one to two days to, to 40 days. So one to two day flights one can do almost above, could almost do above Stuttgart, but they're typically done where there's less population um, in northern Sweden where if the balloon somehow fails and the payload falls down, it would not hit uh, any human, but maybe an elk or a reindeer. Um, if you want to fly longer, you can fly for around a week from Sweden to Canada. Uh, unfortunately, there is no overflight rights over Russia for political reasons at the moment. Or if you want to fly even longer, um, you can fly over Antarctica several rounds around the pole, or something that's coming up at the moment, um, but not quite stable yet, is to launch here in, in Wanaka in New Zealand and fly several around Circum Global. Fly in Antarctica, that gives you around 30 to 40 days of flight. Um, 
these, these round, these round trips um, from Wanaka promise around 100 days. But even with 30 to 40 days of flight, um, the total observation time that you get out of one flight is already very comparable and very similar to what Sofia gets within a year at the moment. At a cost that's around 5% of the Sofia operational cost at the moment. So we're talking about 3 million for an Antarctic launch campaign, flight campaign, total operational costs. So what does that all have to do with Stuttgart? Well, we're reasonably new to the game, but we are now uh, preparing and building the first balloon-based telescope here in Stuttgart. Since it's our first one, we're starting reasonably uh, small. If you can't see the small gondola model here, you can see the larger one up there. Um, the telescope is a half meter aperture telescope, roughly one meter sixty tall, which will be within this gondola, which likely will be yeah, eight meters to ten meters uh, wingspan, seven to eight hundred kilograms. It will be carrying the gondola will be built by a project partner of ours, the Swedish Space Corporation, and will be carrying uh, a UV camera built by the University of Tübingen. If everything goes well, which we still hope. We'll have a launch in September 2021, either from, from Kiuna, which I mentioned, or from Canada. So at two years at the Space Up, I will we'll likely not be able to show you pictures of the launch yet, but at least of the flight-ready payload. Um, at this point, also a short shout out to our friends at CASA who are helping us prepare this with small launches, which I think there's also going to be a presentation about later today. I've heard. <laughs> uh, do I still have two minutes? Good. Then I would show you a last cultural reference of how ballooning was done in the earlier days. But actually, as with space, the technology inside changes, but the way of doing things does not change so much. So if you look at how ballooning was done back then, this is pretty much still the same way how it is done today. Try to launch at low winds, I think that was already quite challenging. Typical Soyuz landing or the typical balloon gondola landing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. How do you appoint the telescope when it's attached to the We have a, so for our project, we have a two stage pointing system. We have a very similar, a very simple gondola pointing system. Um, which uses an, a reaction wheel to point an azimuth, the gondola, and just two direct drive motors to point the telescope in elevation. We get down to around plus minus 40 arc seconds in each, um, each axis, so that's around a hundredth of a degree. Uh, that's not enough for our science, so we have a tilt mirror inside the optical system with a separate guiding camera that brings it down to half an arc second. Nice thing is you don't have high frequency disturbances. Anything in the balloon is pretty smooth. Yeah, we're, we're doing that here. Actually, when we get to flight altitude, uh, you will find that the conditions are pretty much the same as they are for satellites. 
as the atmosphere is so thin that there's basically no convective heat transfer anymore, so you're relying on um, on, on radiation completely. Well, we're also using uh, a satellite tool, satellite design tool for the thermal design. There's one bit that's a bit tricky uh, that comes in addition, which is doing the ascent. And doing the ascent, particularly when you pass the, the tropical faucet around, so 15 to 17 kilometers, the uh, air is still pretty thick, and you have surrounding air temperatures of minus 70, so you somehow need to be able to get through there. Once you're through there, then it's basic engineering again. I'd be happy. All right, I suggest to continue because I think I'm not the only hungry person in this room and we have one more lecture before the lunch break. So I welcome Ms. Shizala Dutrell. She's talking about LJ in space and I think also about the photobioreactor. reactor. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, my name is Gisela Dutrell. I come from Barcelona, but I'm currently working here at the Institute leading the Life Support System uh, and Energy uh, System Group. Uh, I took part on the space station design workshop back in 2009, so I've just realized today it has already been 10 years. Uh, and I have to warn you, it was so good for me that I stayed here, I'm still here, so just be aware it's going to be that good. Uh, but uh, I'm here now to talk about algae and uh, explain you why we have sent algae to space and convince you to uh, why we should be even sending more in the future. So yeah. Our goal is uh, to have algae in space, uh, more than uh, what we have already. And the uh, reason behind that is if we think about the human spaceflight missions that have taken uh, place so far, they were either short duration missions, like the Apollo missions, a couple of weeks to the moon, or they were quite close to the Earth. Today with the International Space Station, 400 uh, kilometers is not that long distance. But if we plan to go farther away, we may think about a, a base on the Moon's surface, or a Mars mission, or even a base on the Mars surface. So we're going for much longer missions and even farther away. And if we want to send humans there, we have to think what humans need. So we need to breathe, drink, and uh, eat. So we need oxygen, portable water, and food. And we will be producing a certain amount of waste or disposal, so we'll be uh, exhaling carbon uh, dioxide, we'll be producing water in form of sweat, condensate in the air, urine and feces. We'll also be producing heat. And we'll use a certain amount of hydrogen water, the exact amount depends on how much water, how much comfort we want to give uh, the astronauts. And the same amount that comes in to the astronauts will come out just as uh, dirty water. If we do the numbers, what does that mean for a Mars mission? Well, in terms of oxygen, six astronauts, 500 days would be two and a half tons of oxygen that would be consumed. Similar amount of food, dry mass, and a huge, huge amount of water. As I said before, the amount of water depends on how much uh, water we provide for hygiene purposes. So, if we put everything together and also consider the tanks that would be required for that, we come up to between 27 and 126 tons of consumables that would be required if we were to bring everything with us for that mission. Just to give you an order of magnitude, uh, the Falcon Heavy currently, uh, or SpaceX uh, says that for their Falcon Heavy they could bring up to 13 tons uh, at a cost of uh, 90 million dollars. So we would need more than one just to bring all the oxygen, food and water that would be required. That's not an option, that would be a lot of launches and a lot of money. So what we require to do is take all we have considered waste so far as potential resources. So we recycle and from this waste we produce new fresh inputs for our astronauts. That's something we're already doing so far. We have at the International uh, Space Stations all, Station already recycling systems. It has been working for over 6,800 days already, and it is possible to recover 42% of the oxygen from the carbon dioxide. It is possible to recover 90% of the water, but we're not able to produce food. There have been some experiments where food has been produced, 
But they were only small experiments. That was not part of the life support system. It was not part of the system uh, maintaining the astronauts. To produce food, we need biology. And uh, there have been already several experiments in that direction. And I'm just going to mention a couple that uh, for me are very significant, but there have been plenty more than the ones I'm going to show. So the first one I like to show always because of its huge magnitude is the Biosphere 2. It was a huge uh, building. You can see here the picture, it's difficult to put it on scale, but it's a huge building. You can see the area was about 16,000 square meters, which contain a lot of plants from different environments. So you can see here that show the picture that were tropical rainforests, uh, upper savannas. So there were different environments with different type of uh, ecosystems or, or plants. It was meant to be for, or it was uh, inhabited by a, a crew of eight. And two long experiments took place uh, early in the 90s, one lasting for two years and the other one six months. There are plenty of books and publications of everything that happened during this experiment, and I'm not going to mention any of that. I'm not an expert on Biosphere 2, but it's uh, an example of how could we reproduce, or one idea, how could we reproduce our Earth on a closed environment, on a closed building. A lot of things failed during this experiment. They had a lot of problems. And that gives us a lesson without going into details what the problems were. It is very hard to reproduce an Earth in a closed environment, especially because we do not have unlimited space. We have to do it in a limited volume that we have available. So we do not have the, the, the buffers that we have here on Earth. Our atmosphere is huge, and small changes do not have a, a huge impact. But in such a, let's say, small uh, space compared to the Earth, uh, small changes have a high impact on the ecosystem itself. So rebuilding an Earth in such a size, it's a very complex and difficult task. That's why I mentioned another approach which is completely different. Uh, that's an European project, uh, Melissa. Uh, in this case, they do not try to build a big Earth, but to focus on the tasks that are required to obtain these resources using biological systems. So once again, I'll not go into detail, but they have different compartments with different biological, with different types of bacteria that treat the waste for human. And each module has a very specific task to break one of the elements into others that can be used for the next block. So we have different blocks that are able to treat, to treat all the wastes that the crew produce and produce fresh oxygen, extract the CO2, produce food and produce fresh water. One of these modules uh, is a plant, so the plants are still there, of course, to produce the food. And uh, plants is uh, also one uh, topic very uh, studied in general, how to cultivate plants in space. And just to mention the last project of an experiment on Earth, the Eden ISS project, uh, they focus on how to cultivate plants, not in space, the experiment is on Earth. Uh, it was actually in the Antarctis for one year, so it's two big containers. You can see here two containers, one containing the plants and one containing different equipment. And here a nice picture with all the plants and the guy that was taking care of them. And what they were focusing here, or one of the main aspects that uh, they uh, have already published, is uh, they have analyzed how much time it actually takes to take care of these plants. And uh, try to see if we want to have enough plants for produce enough food for, for the entire crew, that's going to be a very time demanding, or we have to invest in automa uh, automatization techniques. So those were some experiments on Earth, but uh, what we do on Earth has to be adapted uh, for space. So there have also been very, uh, a lot of experiments on space. And uh, once again, I'm just going to mention two, but uh, there have uh, been more. Uh, one is from the NASA side, they're having very different platforms. Here there's the Veggie. It was on TV, at least in Spain, everywhere when it came up, because it was the first pictures of a nice salad uh, in space and the astronauts eating the first uh, salad uh, four or five years ago. And uh, the advanced plan habitat facility, just uh, an upgrade uh, with more sensors and more capacity than, uh, than Veggie. And that provides us information on how plants grow in microgravity. But microgravity is not the only thing we might be interested in if we're going to space, if we're going to the moon or the Mars surface, we will have a certain level of gravity. So we might also be interested in knowing how plants grow in different gravity levels. And for that, there's also another project, a German project, Eukrop is a satellite where uh, tomatoes plants are growing up there to see how they grow in the conditions uh, 
up there. But the title of my presentation is not about plants, it's algae. So what we have seen until now are higher plants, or what's known as higher plants, but they are not the only biological option. We also have algae. So I'd like to ask in the audience uh, who thinks uh, that uh, they have never eaten algae in their lives. Never ever. Okay, okay. I expected more, but it's okay. Uh, that's good, you're right, uh, because algae are pretty much everywhere. And, uh, well, whoever that has eaten sushi has probably eaten algae, but they are also used as a protein supplement, so you can find them in some uh, drinks. Uh, they, have, uh, they, they are also used uh, as, as a color uh, for a specific blue uh, in food coloring. So yeah, pretty much everyone has already eaten algae at some point. And for the one who hasn't, I brought here some. And uh, I'll just pass them around so everyone can try while I keep on talking. So uh, when uh, we think about algae, you might be thinking of uh, something like these pictures. They're quite big structures. Or even thinking on what happens in the seas and the rivers where we get a lot of algae in places we do not want them to be. And that's one part or one aspect of the algae. But the algae we're working with uh, are actually called microalgae because we cannot see them with our naked eye. We have to look them through a microscope. So what we actually work with, it's a green liquid uh, where the algae are living. Microalgae is uh, also very wide wall. There are different types of microalgae. I'll just show uh, three pictures of three examples of three algae, the microalgae that are completely different in shape. The upper one is chlorella, which is the one going through. And it's very tiny, small, uh, round cells uh, between 4 and 10 micrometers, that's a microscope picture, and the others as well. And as you can see, there are different shapes and different types of algae with different properties, and uh, some are better in producing oxygen, some are better for eating. Each microalgae has its own uh, strength. The one we're using here at the Institute and the one we have sent to space and we're planning to send even more is chlorella, the upper one. Because, uh, because of its shape and its characteristics, it's a very robust algae because it's brown. We can cultivate it pretty much anywhere. You can imagine how these filaments can get stuck uh, in a reactor chamber, while the round algae are more easygoing. Uh, they can also uh, work better at different temperature ranges, pH levels, so they, they adapt themselves uh, easier. The problem with uh, algae is that they are mainly protein. That's the content of protein uh, in our algae. So more than half is protein. I mentioned before that it's used as a, as a food supplement, uh, as a protein source. And what we actually need as humans, we do need proteins, but not that much. Uh, we, need, we need carbohydrates, and that's something the algae don't have. So what we cannot do is just only eat algae. We can substitute part of our food, or the astronauts can substitute part of their food through algae, but not all of it. And uh, if you're trying it and you don't like it, that's the positive part. You will not only eat algae, so you'll be mixing it so any, anyhow with the, other, the rest of the food you'll have. So don't worry if you don't like the taste. Microalgae have been cultivated in, uh, on Earth already for a long time. And they are generally cultivated, or the easiest, cheapest way to cultivate them is in open ponds. And that's kind of a big swimming pool, uh, open which uh, means that we do not have contaminant control, that things can come into our open ponds. Uh, it's also not the most effective way to grow algae. They, they do not grow the fastest here. We, do not, we cannot provide the ideal conditions or the, the, the optimal conditions, but it's cheap and it's simple. And here on Earth, we have a lot of space and we can just use those kind of systems. Other system also used on Earth is a closed system, so we try to avoid having this, this ex external contamination. That would be uh, an example, would be an air lift system. The name is uh, by itself explanatory. We have a wall with algae and we have air coming down and the air is lifting up. Uh, with that, we can control better the, the conditions on the algae and we can make sure that they grow faster compared to the open pond system. And as I've already mentioned, the contamination control. So to give an example of a system that we're using in our lab on that direction, uh, just having a wall would be a FPA, a flat panel airlift reactor, would be this picture. 
I might actually point from time to time to the other side as well. So yeah, this uh, this wall where we would have the algae inside, just inside a wall, we would have the air uh, bubbling up, and we would have, for example, one side illuminated, and we can see that some of the algae have are getting a lot of light. The cells that are in the back are more in the dark. Uh, there was a there is a type of reactor developed by a company not far away from here, uh, Subitech, that improved this type of uh, reactor, uh, making this uh, more complex geometry. You can see that the air bubbles here in this case cannot just go straight up, but they are moving around. And that creates the uh, movement of the algae inside the reactor. So I have my algae moving. That means that they are moving within the liquid. Uh, they get their nutrients through the liquid, so it's a better mixture of the algae and the nutrient solution. We also ensure that the algae are not all the time on the light or all the time on the dark, so we have the algae uh, getting a certain movement and that improves the conditions uh, for, for growth. So those are the systems, or that's one of the type of systems that can be used here on Earth. How could that be done in space? So if we're going to a moon, or Mars surface will have a certain level of gravity, so we can imagine the same type of system being used. That's something we have been start, we have started researching here at the institute on how could the geometry be to adapt the system we know that works so good here on Earth, how to adapt them to obtain the same performance on uh, the surface of the Mars or the Moon. So there's playing with the geometry to make sure that we get the same conditions. But those systems are gravity based. If we gonna want to go to space station or a vehicle going to Mars, we'll have microgravity, so these systems will not work any longer. That's also one of the focus uh, for us here at the Institute, and that's where our experiment photobioreactor uh, came up. So in case of microgravity, we'll have to create this movement of the algae uh, and the air uh, provision in a different way. So in this case, we have a photobioreactor. Here it's first uh, just a green box. I'll show a little bit more in detail how it can be. And uh, we'll have to move the algae. In this case, we use a pump to create circulation of the algae so the algae are moving. And then we'll have to uh, insert CO2 and find a way to extract the oxygen that it's produced. On the system I explained before, we'll just inject down air rich in CO2 and we'll get at the upper side uh, uh, air with less CO2 and more oxygen. But in this case, we'll have to find the means of also separating the, inserting the CO2 and separating the oxygen. So to do that, uh, we have uh, been working for the last, with microalgae for the last 10 years, uh, focused on microgravity for the last five, six years, and developed an experiment, the photobioreactor, together with the LR and, uh, and the company Airbus, that looks like that. I have a small mock-up uh, over there I can show afterwards, where we have our system with the algae growing inside. What I before said, it's just a green box. It's what's shown in the picture. And I can also show it around. So the living compartment for the algae is nothing more than a plate with some channels built on it. So we have the algae moving in the small channels thanks to the pump that it's creating the, the, the it's moving the, the, the liquid inside. So in these reactors, we then put a membrane at each side, which makes sure that the liquid stays in there, but that the gas can be exchanged, so that the CO2 can get into the algae and the oxygen produced can get out to the atmosphere. We have the membrane put on there, and we have a membrane holder to make sure that the membrane stays where it's supposed to be. So that would be one photobioreactor unit or one reactor unit. And we would then put as well light in both sides. So we have LED panels at both sides to provide the light that the algae required. Uh, differently to plants, algae can be illuminated 24-7. Uh, so we can have the algae uh, on light uh, for most of the time. There are some tubings where there's no lighting, but most of the time our algae are seeing light. So inside the experiment, there are these two reactors, uh, two pieces uh, of uh, what is now going around. And uh, the algae also need to eat. So we have to provide them uh, with nutrients. And uh, to do that, we have created the so-called liquid exchange equipment, which is nothing else than a set of uh, syringes, 
with the different liquids that uh, the algae required. So we started our experiment with water inside and uh, we first inserted nutrients, then inserted the algae. So the experiment started running. And from time to time, the algae require more nutrients. And since the algae are growing inside, we also have to extract part of the grown mass because otherwise at some point the reactor would be full of algae. They would like, fight with each other for survival. So we would reach a point where the algae would not grow anymore if we don't extract them. Uh, the experiment went to space uh, last May. Uh, started operations uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, the algae started growing very nicely, and I have a nice picture from the station uh, with the, one of the syringes where a sample was taken, so that's material extracted from uh, our reactor. And uh, it actually feels, feels kind of cool because uh, these syringes, uh, I also have a couple of them here, uh, were made here in the Space Institute. We used the satellite clean room to make sure that they were clean as they are supposed to be for, for biology and um, for station purposes. So uh, you cannot see that in the picture, but in each of these syringes there is a logo of our institute, so we're very proud to have uh, our uh, self-made syringes out there uh, with our logo. So our goal with this experiment uh, is to, was to prove, or is to prove uh, that algae can grow in space, that we can create the technology that the algae required to work and provide what the astronauts need in space. We are currently having some troubles and it uh, looks like our experiment is going to be shorter than planned, but we are looking to future plans and to see how we are going to continue uh, working with algae in space. So that's why I said we hope to send even more algae to space and that one day the algae will be part of the life support system and that the oxygen that the astronauts will breathe will be oxygen partly coming from the algae and that they will also eat the algae. Uh, I know if some of you have already tried the chlorella that was going around. Is it good? No. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, you have to mix it anyway, so uh, it's not that bad. Uh, with a little sugar or salt, the salt no, but uh, mixed with other things, uh, it will surely be tasty enough. So we see algae as uh, part of the life support system for the future. Not the only thing, I'm not saying that we should not use plants, but uh, it's probably going to be a combination of currently existing systems, plants and algae. But not only are they a solution for our future in space, they are also a problem solver here on Earth today. We can use the algae to clean the air, we can have uh, algae systems on, on uh, cities with uh, very high CO2 concentrations to clean the air or to partially clean the air. They can also be used to clean the water. Uh, or to produce food in areas with uh, very little resources. So, of course, we are working thorough space, but we're also always keeping in mind that uh, these systems can also be applied here on Earth. And that concludes my presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy, you know, not if it's lunchtime already, but uh, I'll be here the entire day, so uh, you can just approach me anytime. Thank you. Do you have any questions now? Uh, question, uh, are the algae separated or extracted uh, in this field or are they um, extracted all by once? Or? We are extracting uh, only part of each every time. Uh, so we, we have uh, enough uh, inside that it keeps growing farther. Uh, the idea in the future is to make it uh, an automatic system that continuously keeps extracting a little bit. We could not do that for our experiment now, but that would be the goal, that it continuously takes a little bit out. Yeah. Are the algae not sticking to the walls? There, yeah, yes, uh, so uh, the channels uh, are very, uh, in, the, in the one uh, it's going through, it's a 3D printed and it's not really uh, the surface as it's uh, in our reactor. Uh, we had to process the walls very carefully so they are as flat as possible, not with roughness, because otherwise these small cells stick everywhere. The first experiments we had here, the walls were not good enough and we had a lot of accumulation, but we've tried to get less less every time. Yeah. Yeah, well. 
I did not. I did not. Uh, for now, they they are. They, we have to bring them up every time, so they are not recycled. But that's also one of the things we have to look in the future. Like from the materials that we're getting from the humans, we can extract uh, the nutrients uh, for the algae. So at some point, it would be a closed loop. It's not uh, right now for our experiment. Uh, we're not that far yet. But that's also one direction we're working. That's from human urine. We can extract the nutrients required for the algae. Which wavelength of light are you using? And what is the overall um, efficiency of the process from Electricity to We're using red and blue, uh, the exact wavelengths I have to check. Um, we were not doing that in our lab, we were using white light. Uh, we had power restrictions uh, for the experiment, so that's why we had to restrict it. And chlorella has two clear peaks on the blue and red light. Um, so it was pretty obvious, like we had to go to those uh, two. Um, for future experiments, we might have to consider if the part that we're missing is okay or not. Uh, we have been doing several experiments over six months here with blue and red, and uh, we did not observe any problems. How that efficient is, I cannot tell yet. Uh, we are working not in the optimum uh, spectrum here. Uh, on what biomass production means. Uh, we first wanted to show that it's even feasible to do such a reactor. Um, this type of reactor might also not be the most optimal one. If we want to go to the moon or Mars surface, we'll rather go to the others which uh, higher, with higher growth rates. So it's, it's something that's still on, on, on ongoing yeah, research. Yeah. How many calories does the reactor produce? Uh, it can produce up to one gram per day uh, and uh, in you ask uh, kilocalories right that would relate to the graphic uh, before I think the number was there Opa, sorry uh, it keeps on moving sorry not me anymore. <laughs> I press it too many times, I guess. One more. Yeah, so that's the yeah, well, kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so it's doing one gram. Uh, yeah. The, the this amount of liquid we have, it's less than a liter, but uh, yeah, that's. A small system like that produces one gram. So yeah, for, for uh, what we have now, it's a very small technology demonstrator. Uh, to produce enough for a human, we would need a couple of hundred of liters. That's not just going to be such a small system. It's going to be much bigger than that. Would they survive in direct sunlight in space? Or do they have to be uh, protected from radiation and all sorts of things? That's a good question, and we had been working uh, on radiation a little bit here at the institute. There was a, an, uh, a cooperation with another institute, which I, I was not involved, so I cannot really tell much about that. But I think the results showed that uh, with the test we could do here, that there was no big uh, impact, but it's something that needs to further be tested. There had been some experiments, and I, I would need to check the data. Uh, with algae being outside the station, like not working, but in a dormant mode, but outside. Yeah. Uh, getting more radiation than here, and uh, that that would be a start point. But there's still further work. It, they have also been. It has also been considered if it should be used. This because we will have a couple of hundreds of liters. If it should be used as radiation shielding as well. And then the question arises: Will the algae change yeah. so we cannot eat them anymore? Maybe so. There's uh, then a trade-off. What do I want to achieve with my system? I cannot get it all, probably. It could be used for shielding. Is that what you said? Yeah, there are studies on, on, on using, because we'll have water, well, you can have a water, partially water shielding system, yep. you can as well have the algae living in there. Okay. Yeah. Yes. But as I said, there's still further research needed until we can be sure that uh, they would be good with it.
Thank you. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Now it's lunch break time. Um, Daniel, who is standing over there in the edge, spontaneously offered to give some uh, guided tours to the plasma wind tunnel here in the next building. So who is interested can just go to him and see the tunnels over there. <laughs> you know, please, please don't go in there with food. All right, and afterwards, um, Please fill in and please post your topics to the grid until, let's say, in half an hour, so that we can just make sure that it's worth. All right.